what quantum will allow us to do, and this is where people have issues, is solve really hard math problems very quickly. Uh, and encryption uh, and authentication are in the crux of those things uh, that are there. And I think that's, that's the big concern for a lot of organizations. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative and WIZ is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership with one of the contributors to my latest book, the best-selling CISO Compass Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, as well as from other top CISOs and security thought leaders. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To to learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. I am your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Richard Rushing, CISO at Motorola Mobility, a Lenovo company. A really early age, uh, and it's not just the cybersecurity field, it was technology. When I was growing up uh, as a kid, my father worked at the point in time for a large mainframe company uh, called Honeywell. And so I had tech in the house in the late 70s, you could, I could be watching Star Trek and you know, I knew exactly what things looked like, what it was and thought it was really super cool uh, to do things on that. So it, it kind of, I always envisioned that as being like, that's the driving side of it. It, it attracted my sci-fi passion and bound it to stuff. So early on in fifth grade, I was programming, I was learning languages, I had my own uh, personal computer, so I, I, I gravitated into that area. And then as we got into the world, I, I kind of understood that information had value, because back then it wasn't, there was no internet, there was no way to go reference things, it was documents and photocopies of books, manuals, information, people use that. It was a bartering system and a trading system. Social currency was used on that side of it that's there, but it had intrinsic value to the rest of the area. And any of those technology people at the time were, yeah, you were interested in breaking things, how things were working. And that where I came from, I was more interested in understanding how things operated and then what protections were there. And then you got good with hardware, which meant that you got good with software. And you it just kind of kind of stepped up into that. And I think getting into the cyberspace was like everybody in this age, kind of, you just gravitated towards an area. And it was, it was sucking you in like a black hole because it literally was like, hey, this is cool. And it kept accelerating as it went through because it started kind of in my age, it's like, Username, password. Uh, that's your security. Uh, that was it. Uh, you, you weren't even in IP addresses in, in a lot of cases on that side mm -hmm. of it. So you continued on that. And I think that was the driving factor of just, hey, there's problems and there's issues with that. So sure. it, there was always like, what can I do to fix it? What can I do to make it better? Uh, always came into that, that, that area. And then you just kept developing it. And you kind of fell into the role uh, on that side of it that's there. Um, and I knew what it was. I looked at the, the market when it first started. And I had a startup that was soon in the late 90s uh, called Secure IT that we cap we were a security service company. We were the first security service company to get acquired. And that came out purely from the fact that, yeah, we were, I was working at large industrial conglomerate that was like, oh, well, the internet, I'm not going to really take off all these things around other networks. And I was like, no, I see the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. And then, well, I, I know you had a, a very entrepreneurial uh, spirit there. I know I, I, I I first met you, you know, over 15 years ago in, in Mexico City, of all places, uh, even though you're in the Chicago area and I'm in the Chicago area. Uh, and, and, you, and I know that you had a, had a company at that time uh, before your, your current role as the uh, CISO for Motorola Mobility. 
Correct. And it, it was the same thing. I was, I was solving, uh, management issues in the first one. The last one was wireless security. So I, I kind of follow these, Hey, this is super interesting. This is super passionate about it and I want to make it better, but I need to understand it. I need to do it. So it just came into the same side of it that was there. And when I came to Motorola, I had the opportunity to uh, jump into the CISO role as we were divesting. And it, it was, it was, yeah, it, been there 15 years now and continuing on. So it it's kind of one of those things that once you like something and you do it, that classic line that, hey, if you enjoy something, you'll never work a day in your life. I, I enjoy cybersecurity. Well, uh, you must you must be doing something right because uh, you've obviously been there a long time as a CISO and, and we know CISOs always don't get to occupy that chair for a long time. So, so let's flip to our, our topic today. Um, and, and I love talking to you because I know you do dig very deeply into the, the new technologies and, and question them and, and not look at things uh, at, at their face value. And um, so, so as, as we talk about quantum computing, could, could you just give like just a brief, um, you know, overview for people that haven't spent a lot of time with quantum computing, you know, what is that all about and how, how does that differentiate from the computing that we have today? So if you think about quantum computing in general, it's really uh, a, 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 an entire field of study. It's not, hey, this is, we're doing quantum computers. It's like, no, there's algorithms, other things, AI, different areas that it all involves. So it's a very broad um, area of study, typically focused on computer-based technologies, how they integrate and everything else. But it's around the principles of quantum theory. So you're not, you're, you're, you're developing a whole series of items and software, hardware, ideas uh, around theories that are dealing with the quantum state uh, that's there, which in and, in and of itself, there's lots of analogies. Just we're taught that data is one and a zero that's there. It's, it's kind of that sequence of binary. It's one or zero, one or zero. In the world of quantum, it could be either. And that allows you to do, think about it as lots of different things. If you're doing computational things, it's like, if I figure out that equation, I've solved for all possibilities. And those are things that you get into that are, are vastly different. And this is where you can get your computing time down from years or centuries to days kind of scenarios. Um, and that's what's doing. It's still very new. There's still lots of area. Just remember, it's based on quantum theory. So if the theory, something changes, it could disrupt everything that's on the backside of it. But so far, that's not occurred. When when do you think that that we will have these quantum computers? And, and is this a, a, a risk that we should be worried about today? <laughs> The idea of the quantum computers, they exist today. Uh, everybody's spending lots of money in it. They, they are not computational powerhouses uh, per se from just the compute power of that. What they can do and solve, uh, you don't need all the hardware to be able to do the same function. Uh, I kind of refer it as instruction sets and things around that. Uh, you, you've seen that over the ages, things gotten better. People do things differently. And it's the same in the quantum computing. It, it, it's there. Um, I think it's still very new. Um, it's getting better. Uh, what's being produced now is a much a ten, a, about 10 X factor uh, better than what was there uh, based on its performance. So they're able to get more out of them, use more things that are there. But you have to also remember that the hardware is one component of it. The software, everything that's going into that and everything that's being used is like things that are de developed have to kind of mature and come into the, the fold on that because it's not the same side of it, of where I can take something normal 
and apply it and just hit it with a piece of hardware and it's going to solve it. No, you really have to define how it is because the idea process is different. So you can't kind of use, hey, I wrote code in one and I can just take it and port it to the other one and it and it's, well, it doesn't work. But what quantum will allow us to do, and this is where people have issues, is solve really hard math problems very quickly. Uh, and encryption uh, and authentication are in the crux of those things uh, that are there. And I think that's that's the big concern for a lot of organizations that, hey, if this is can be fixed, okay, I can disrupt uh whole kind of uh, environments just by seeing the traffic or just recording the traffic and then keeping it for a, a future point where the technology catches up uh, on that side of it that's there. So NIST came out recently with some recommendations around, you know, different uh, quantum resistant uh, uh, methods to do the encryption. Um, do you think that has a big impact or, or not? I think it's, a, it, it's something that's in the future. Um, and at some point, it's what the data is, is going to be uh, in the future uh, that's there. And I th there is some, and there, there's kind of a, a dividing line that's like, yeah, this is FUD, and then this is real areas and that that dividing line kind of shifts back and forth but you're starting to see more things come in to the real area and the NIST guidelines is a perfect example of this is like if you think about it these are going to these are going to be kind of the hey if you want to quantum existing algorithms that AES is not here here, 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 here's going to be the choices for data at rest, data in transit, uh, PKI. So they're, they're already thinking about it, and those standards are actually going to help. Um, I, I think from the standard perspective, it one, makes it real. Two, it makes it easier to adopt because before it was kind of the, the, the I would, don't want to say the FUD side, but it was like you had to build your own algorithm. You had to use their algorithm, which may not been in any of the ones that are choices now. Now you're coming up with kind of standardizations and things around that. You've had a lot of people really look deep in these algorithms and things around that nature. And they're, they're kind of set. So you, you see the marketplace kind of move from, hey, this is going to be the nice to have, the future, the bleeding edge, to you're now kind of in the advanced middle of the road kind of environment where you should be making decisions around the quantum side of it that's there. And it could be the decision is we see the algorithms coming. We feel that our providers are going to enable the algorithms. And we've seen that from a lot of the cloud providers and some of the other ones that they have plans uh, on, on some of those areas as well. So you can see that the industry has kind of now started to move into this direction, which kind of leads more of the capabilities that, hey, we're kind of advancing this to we're at the protection level in the classic NIST framework and not the detection level that's there where it's like, hey, we can apply uh, things to this so that it stays safe instead of waiting till it's broken and then you're in a race condition to get it fixed and resolved. And that may never be able to occur in a timely manner. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers. Do, do you think many companies are, are putting energy into this, or is it a kind of an interesting sideline thing that isn't making its way into the budgets yet? I don't think it's making its way into some of the budgets for companies, but there are certain organizations and companies that this is um, table stakes for them. Um, IoT world of devices and things around that. Uh, 
putting something in that it's not going to be taken out for 10 or 15 years and it's really hardware and it's really on the top of a mountain at the bottom of an ocean and you know what it yeah that the, those things are really important and those are initiatives that are already being established in, in some of those areas uh for those kind of companies or organizations that are there but i think that's you're 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 seeing kind of the bell curve on that and it's it's still some of the early adopters but that early adopters now is getting into a lot of more mainstream things and it's it's a it's about it's the classic can i update it in software yes or no and you have to remember with encryption most of the encryption that we're dealing with has all been offloaded out of the software on our computers and put into hardware and silicone on the systems. Mm -hmm. So enabling something that doesn't rely on the same process, you may get performance degradations and things around that. But again, that silicone is going to change. That's going to be updated in the future. So some of these problems in the world of quantum will disappear. Uh, as we kind of move forward on that. So I think it's one of the classics that's there. It is a chicken and an egg scenario, but at the same time, it's quantum computing. So I can have both a chicken and an egg simultaneously. So this is the same thing that I think you need to look at is that don't look at why not to start, but look at about where would you start if you could and what, what does that entail? And some of it is just creating a plan. And, and kind of putting the four four, and I was like, hey, this is questions we ask. I remember SAML and asking providers and cloud providers, do you support SAML version two? And they're like, no one's ever asked that before. And I think it's the same thing. It's our duty as people to ask these questions. What are you doing about quantum computing? Are your algorithms going to support it in the future? So you can kind of start getting that education, but you can also start figuring out that are you going to be on an own or is this going to be just a, like a progression of a, a, a algorithm like TLS? Oh, we're going from 1.1 to 1.2. Is it going to be something that simple or is it going to be very complicated? And I think it's going to be on the complicated side because you, there's a lot of things of data encryption uh, at rest and things around that. But again, a lot of this is moving into hardware. A lot of this makes it an easy kind of jump, but you need to have a plan for it and you need, need to be looking out for it because if you wait till it's too late, that's going to be a really bad situation. So so what should CISOs be looking at to, to make sure that they're, they're it's in the plan? If you're starting off and, and saying, okay, I want to get my arms around this, what, what sort of things should they be looking for? So I, I think it's one of the things. I don't think you're... you're, you're you need to look out and look at um, kind of the same thing of the classic you need to identify, you need to get an inventory. And what I mean by that is you look at it and say, okay, what products do I use today for my data at rest protection storage? Okay. Is it storage? Is it encrypted storage? Is it hardware encrypted storage? What is the storage there? Is it cloud storage? Is it an S3 bucket? And all those different things that are out there and there's thousands of variants of just the storage area you need to figure out which ones you're using today do they have a, a, a quantum computing side of it because you're not going to build something or you're not going to really bolt something on in most cases you want them to provide that service so you need to ask them and you need to see what's there and that's going to develop into where you're going to go if they're not going to support it or they like it's not on our roadmap you might want to look for another vendor as part of that from a storage perspective the communication perspective is the same thing as the algorithms that are going to support um their data communications that are going whether it's the classic tunnels that are already tacked up uh, that you use today or whether it's something else, there's hardware involved in that, there's software involved in that. Understanding where those identifications are is the first step to say, okay, I wanna communicate data, I wanna do it securely, how is that going to do? And then the other side is how I'm gonna store data that's there. Now, the third part is how do I build? If I'm building applications, that should be something that you're on your internal roadmap to be able to do support. And I think that kind of, journey is like once i understand my footprint i can now start doing and the footprint is just understanding it and being able to have those conversations now your next step is like okay 
I've got three vendors out of 20 that are going to support this. What are we going to do? That's discussions you're going to have to have. Is it new hardware? Is it firmware update? Is it software? Is it additional module? Where does that those lines come in? And that's where you start getting that plan. That's where you start getting, I need to test it. I need to proof of concept it, proof of value, see where it's some of those reach in. But it's three distinct areas and three usually areas inside the organization that you should be looking at that's there. And it's not a huge heavy lift because again, you're looking for vendors to provide the support for the encryption at rest side of it. You're looking for third parties to supply your debt communications as well as yourself. And then on the third end, the development side of it, you're looking for people that are going to use um, and quantum resistant uh, encryption on the devices or on the software that you're building as part of that, that's there. It's the same thing of like, just go back to the old days when people just used HTTP to send data. It's like port 80, go, I don't care about encryption. And that's no longer the case anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are now super concerned from a regulatory compliance issues and everything else. It gets into the same thing. Once an encryption algorithm is broken, it's it has no protection that's going to be used and leveraged to be able to do it. And that time, it's like, oh, it takes 10 days, three days, an hour. It's never getting sh longer. It's always getting shorter. And okay. so you're going to have to do something about that. Well, and I know there's some other uh, techniques that are out there that, that different companies are, you know, experimenting with that may or may not require uh quantum computers to, to break the encryption as well. Um, so, you know, the, the question, uh, you know, that we always have is how do I, how do I convince my management? And, and I, and I was reading recently where somebody was comparing the quantum computing to the airplane uh, industry and that it took 60 years from the Wright brothers, you know, flying an airplane to where we were where we were having passengers and airplanes full of things um, and and the developments that happened during that time. And we also have the transistors today that, that make it possible for us to have great compute power in our smartphones. And, and so we don't know what technologies are, are going to get discovered <clears throat> along the way. So, so how do I convince my management that that I should spend some time looking at the quantum computing area. Now, I I think it's one of the things that's there. It's it's like anything else. Uh, you 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 can wait, and to your point of the aircraft analogy, which is really good. The longer I wait the longer it takes me to actually have benefits or practicality that's there. Um, if you, if you go, it's like, okay, I got to study this for at least six months. So I understand, or I got to conduct inventory, grab everything together and then come back on the other side of it and goes here. This is what we're, this is what my problem is. Now I can have a conversation that's going to take six months, a year, if something bad happens, you go, we're on it. That is a year before you're able to do anything. And that may be a year that you're completely insecure. And I think at those points in time that you go back on that is that you really have to do that. It is a risk-based decision, but the idea behind that is that if it's simple changes, it's not we need to rip and replace certain things, storage, different kind of story, transmission and data and buildings, very different that's there. It's making that decision that says, put a stick in the ground or, hey, we want to start doing this because you can see from NIST, you can see from all the government, you can see from everywhere in the market, they're telling you that you have to start thinking about this and doing something about it. So people are worried. And they're worried in a not a good way kind of scenario where it is like, hey, this is important. Need to do this. And this is not coming from, oh, theoretical. Here is things that are out there. This is coming from people that deal with large amounts of data that have very 
very, very high values that they're like, they're worried to death of, of sending it or doing it and anything else that should tell us something that, Hey, what the lack of somebody saying something directly, but their actions are what speaking on that. And you can see that their initiatives uh, from executive orders and other things are all focused on this to say, this is a problem we need to address now. Uh, and so you can see this coming into it. And I, and what if there's a regulatory requirement somewhere that says you must enable this? Oh, now, great. I now need a year before I can enable it. Oh yeah. By the way, you only have three months and you'll be fine if you don't. And I'm like, Oh, I haven't, you have to get started. You have to figure out what works in your environment, how it is, what vendors are going to support it. Once you figure out that, and that's, that's just time and effort on your part. You're, you got 90% of it solved. Uh, on that side of it. Now it's going back to the problem. Where do you want to start? And it's like, you can start an initiative and say, here's where our biggest buck is in, uh, in, in the applications we develop in directly. We should have quantum encryption built into those when, when it's available uh, to use on the platform of our choice. And that's just a decision. Uh, it's, you're, not, you're not saying, I need to build a quantum computer. I need to do something around it. I just need to take a step forward uh, on that. And then there, guess what? There'll be another step after that as well. I, I think that's fantastic advice. And uh, Rich, it's, it's been great um, talking with you to, about this today. You know, this is an area that, that all CISOs should have on their radar. Uh, any last thoughts that you want to share with uh, our CISOs? No, I, I think it's anything else. There's a lot of fear. Uh, and unfortunately, in our space, uh, th there's a lot of marketing uh, of new technology. And unfortunately, people take it sometimes wrong uh, that's there. It's like, is this pushing something? Is this pushing something that's not needed? Is this the next big thing that's not really the next big thing and kind of flows away? That's the ebb and flow of the industry that we're in. And I think from that point, one thing that you can learn is that, and cloud was a perfect example of it, the people that benefited from cloud jumped in and adopted cloud early. They got their feet wet. They understood which clouds did what, what ones were the best and made mistakes and configuration and learned DevOps all at simultaneously that was there. And they were better off a year later than someone just, oh, we're going to the cloud now. Let's make this happen. Mm -hmm. Or COVID world, guess what? Everything's going to the cloud. Uh, and if you weren't there, you, you, you missed a lot of capability, but you were struggling night and day trying to make it happen because when you could have spent the time and the effort that there, you, you didn't, and, and it turned into the same thing uh, at the end that it's like your struggle, I had to bring in consultants. I had to bring in outside resources because I didn't have people that understood this and were adapted being able to do it. Well, Rich, I, I think that's that's fantastic advice, uh, a great analogy. And uh, thanks for taking the time today uh, to speak with our listeners. My pleasure as always. Anytime, Todd, it's always a good to see you uh, and speak with you, uh, my friend. Great to see you again as well. Thanks, Rich. Thanks. WIZ is on a mission to help every organization rapidly identify and remove critical risks in their cloud environments. Purpose built for the cloud, WIZ delivers full stack visibility, accurate risk prioritization, and enhanced business agility. WIZ connects in minutes using an agentless approach that scans both platform configurations and inside every workload. We perform a deep assessment that goes beyond what standalone CSPM and CWPP tools offer to find a toxic combination of flaws that represent real risk. To learn more about Wiz, please visit securityweekly.com slash Wiz.